My name is uh, Monica Piergiovanni. I work for the European Commission's Joint Research Centre and I am in the unit of Chemical Safety and Alternative Methods, which incorporates uh, Ural ECVA, that is the European Union Laboratory uh, for Alternatives to Animal Testing. And I am working in the field of complex in vitro methods, uh, specifically with organ on chip technology, uh, which are devices that are designed to reproduce specific features of organs in the lab, providing human relevant information. Um, I have a background in biomedical engineering. I got my degrees and PhD from Politecnico di Milano in Italy, uh, where I also worked as a postdoc researcher in the field of design, prototyping and testing of microfluidic devices for biological applications. First of all, I'd like to, to explain a bit what are these organ on chip devices. Uh, so these devices are uh, miniaturized living organs that can be used uh, in the lab to reproduce specific organ functions. So um, in this technology, we have a combination uh, from different fields. So from microelectronics, engineering, physics, chemistry and biology. Uh, so for instance, we have devices that like lung on a chip, heart on a chip, um, liver on a chip, and all of these devices can have different applications in various fields. Um, so my, my, main, um, my main objective is to promote the use of these devices in, uh, as a scientifically credible alternatives to animal in science. So this means that I, um, uh, keeping this in mind, this means that I do uh, a lot of different tasks that go from uh, laboratory work um, to article writing and reviewing in order to understand and explore which are the uses of these devices both in regulatory and biomedical sciences. Um, also, I also do a, a lot of data analysis and scientific writings, of course, but also a lot of network building, uh, both with the developers of the devices, but also end users and regulators across the field in order to identify uh, which could be the needs and which are the strategies to increase the use of these technologies in various fields. To be honest, uh, looking back at my past, uh, I don't think that I have like one source of inspiration. So, you know, like one serendipity moment when you say, okay, that's what I want to do. Um, I think that I got interested and I got uh, in love, let's say, with science uh, slowly but constantly in time. So, of course, uh, my family um, helped me a lot, uh, encouraged my passions, uh, but also friends, uh, especially those who did not have interest in science. That was very stimulating to discuss with them. Uh, also books and journals that I, I read a lot and I made a lot of, you know, these house made experiments that you can, you can do when you're a child with your parents. And this, I mean, they are not really um, inspiring you in your career, but they are uh, encouraging your love for, for technology and science. So, so basically it, for me, it was more like a journey. It really depends because um, in some uh, periods, like in some weeks of the month, I have experimental work plan in the lab. Uh, and this usually, uh, let's say, is very demanding in terms of time and tasks that have to be performed. Uh, because, you know, you need to follow study plans and protocols, you have to book uh, instruments and also uh, spend time with other researchers to do things together. So if I have this sort of experimental activity planned, uh, it usually defines more or less the rest of the day. Um, and actually the week, I would say, because experiments usually mm, last a um, couple or three weeks together. Uh, but otherwise, I participate in, in many meetings that tend to be clustered um, in the central hours of the, of the day. Uh, while I, I like a lot the early hours and the late, very late afternoon to, 
to you know do this computer work data analysis writing and um, I try to 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 cluster these activities in very specific hours in order to be focused on that and not distracted by colleagues or meetings that can come up. My career path was very linear and very ordinary, let's say. So I started uh, from a scientific high school and I decided to study engineering. Um, I was a bit undecided between biomedical engineering and civil engineering and architecture. But in the end, I, I chose biomedical engineering. Um, I studied at the same university, as I said, in, in Politecnico di Milano, also for, for my uh, PhD. And, and to be honest, um, I was very focused on studying and, and learning and going through the exam. So I did not have, um, I did not look for, you know, internships or Erasmus programs or periods abroad. Um, but it was actually during uh, my thesis, uh, my master's thesis, that I decided that I wanted to do research uh, because I had a very experimental, um, and very engaging activity to do. And, and then during the PhD, I understood that it was not research per se that was the main interest uh, um, for me, but also the process that, that brings the discovery to, to the real world um, that, that we are now. I definitely would uh, choose biomedical engineering again. I think that will, will stay. Um, Probably I would uh, fill my career, my study career with more experiences, let's say outside of the books. So more uh, looking for in internships in uh, companies, for instance, but also um, in other universities, like in the form of uh, periods abroad or exchanges. Um, and, and this is also valid, I have to be honest, also for my PhD, because I spent uh, four months in, in Switzerland. Um, and maybe I should have done like more, uh, more time or more experiences. So this is basically what I would change, definitely. The main experience that I had, I, as I said, was during the thesis. So in, the, in my master thesis, I worked on a microfluidic device to uh, use the patient's red blood cells as a drug delivery system. So in this, um, as, you, as you see, it's a very, uh, let's say, peculiar uh, application where I had, I had the opportunity to come, uh, to go, to come in touch with the, um, uh, also other um, problems which are not only scientific but you know the clinical applicability of this uh, of this idea uh, the pharmacology that is something that we don't really touch in engineering um, and also during that time I I could um, work both on experimental and on computational models uh, so this means that I really uh, gave a very broad uh, overview of the many possibilities that there are after, you know, the degree and what you can do and in which fields and with what techniques that you that you are developing during the degree, the, the university years. It's a bit, let's say, uh, difficult to say who uh, ended up where. Um, but uh, to be honest, I think that each of us really found um, found a spot in the world that was uh, predicted by the university career. I mean, that with biomedical engineering, you have uh, very specific uh, competencies um, that are, of course, related to medical devices and technologies. Uh, which can can bring you in uh, in different zones in different uh, parts let's say of the working space so some of them uh, went up working in companies uh, some of my colleagues uh, went out went up um, funding their own startup their own company that is also that is also cool 
and, and some, some others that were more like me on this uh, biotechnology, they are also working in innovative fields, let's say like I am. Regarding the professional skills, I think that um, with any background, uh, let's say in, engineer, in biomedical engineering, but also in toxicology and pharmacology um, or, or biotechnology, for instance, these are all um, backgrounds that, that can work really well in working as I do. Uh, what I am learning, let's say now, is to to work on the uh, personal skills so of course um, analytical skills are always useful like critical thinking and problem solving they they help um, they help i think in every job in the end because you can easily uh, find um, creative solutions that that you can then uh, refine and develop in a in a more let's say ordered way uh, but also i think that it's important to have uh, curiosity but also initiative because as i said this is a very innovative uh, field where i work and there is no, let's say, uh, already defined pathway. So it's up to us to define uh, what we want to do and how, how best um, obtain uh, the use of these devices in various industries. Uh, but also, also a lot of motivation and resilience because I have to say that sometimes there is a bit of reluctance in the big let's say in the big companies to uh, include and use these very innovative technologies which are not exactly uh, easily easy to use and not exactly um, uh, let's say uh, time uh, money um, saving so they are quite expensive even if they have a very obvious added value and so you have to, to convince them and with, with data, but also with your, uh, with your personality. So I think that starting from my technical background, um, I had to develop after university a lot of presentation and storytelling skills, um, which I think now are fundamental, but um, that's, that's okay because there are a lot of very good uh, trainers and courses that you can take to, to develop those. Um, but it's fundamental because you have to have a way to make complex technology understandable to a non-technical audience. And it's, it's, uh, this takes a lot of practice to do and also a lot of time to obtain a result. Regarding the career prospects, I think that the um, my study path gave different uh, opportunities. So in my case, I decided to go uh, towards innovative technology, and these are can be integrated in pharmaceuticals, uh, chemicals, cosmetics. So in every field, there is a possibility to include these technologies. And for sure, this is um, one option that's not easy because I have to say that the, the career path, it's very requires very high competencies, uh, but it's very risky in terms of work stability uh, in time. However, it never gets boring, so you can you can trust that it's a very in innovative and interesting career path. Uh, but otherwise, there are other prospects. So the, um, there are, of course, the a very common choice is to work in a medical device or diagnostic company with positions that can go from R&D, uh, technical engineer, field engineer, uh, regulatory affairs. Uh, but also, since there are a lot of uh, high-tech instruments and uh, medical procedures, uh, there is also a possibility to work, let's say, in public or private hospitals um, as a support engineer. It's also quite frequent. Um, and also a very also attractive option is the consulting, which is always a possibility for us. But I would recommend it to a later stage, so when, when you have a a broad and solid professional network that you can use to uh, to sell your capability and your consta consultancy in the end. 
So main challenges uh, from a researcher, I think that, so let's be honest, uh, it's not very, it, it could get boring uh, in the everyday life to, to, do, uh, to do research. So even if we, we may not want to talk about it, but uh, it's, it's like uh, you can have days when there is, your experiment is not working, there is something that you don't understand, you have to try and try again, continuously failing. So you need a lot uh, of dedication and also a bit of luck. And it's, it could be different to keep up with this situation day by day. And it's not always, not always easy, of course, to continue um, keeping up your, your motivation and your, also your hopes to, go, to get a result. But in the end, when you get those precious little one result, that's you are very, like you're high, no? You are very, uh, very excited and that's, also um, a rewarding for all the failures that you had in the past. Um, another challenge I think is communication, because you know in research we have to present our results to others, to our, to our peers, uh, and it takes a lot of prefer preparation and also courage to take opinions that could be very different uh, from yours and even go against your own, your own theory. So this is also, uh, this is also a challenge in that we have to to take care of. So my advice to students is uh, quite simple. So be creative, be patient and be curious uh, and use whatever opportunity life gives to you. So uh, follow your passion and instincts. Take your time because there is no, no rush, there is no hurry to you know, decide which your career path will be. Um, and don't hesitate to ask for information, knowledge, and even time, because sometimes uh, there is a lot of pressure around you that uh, wants you to, to, to take uh, a choice or wants you to take a path, but that's not necessarily the, the best thing. So take your time and explore the possibilities, get informed. Now we have this fantastic websites and also blog posts that uh, can really uh, well explain uh, all the possibilities that are in front of you in terms of science, uh, technology, engineering, and mathematics, of course. And, and in, most important, I think, just be free to choice, to, to choose whatever you like without any constraints from, you know, expectation from your parents, friends, society. Just take your time and uh, evaluate the pros and cons of your choice and uh, that's a very scientific way of doing things. <laughs> Evaluate what, what are your options and your passions and your attitudes, and then just go straight. In a nutshell, I would say that a career in the three R's is important because mice are not human beings. So it's really as simple as that. So traditionally, uh, we rely on animal models for two main purposes. The first one is to generate data in order to assess the safety of compounds for use in humans. So these include chemicals, uh, cosmetics, medicinal products, food additives, and many more. And the second uh, is that animals are used for biomedical research as models to study human diseases or other health problems and to develop new treatments. So you can easily understand that shifting to new animal-free methodologies and research strategies can enhance the understanding of human-specific biology and diseases. Obviously, then we do not want uh, animals to suffer and the society is less and less willing to accept the use of animals for scientific purposes. But what can you do uh, concretely? So the beauty of this field to me is that it is highly multi and interdisciplinary. So whatever STEM career uh, you would like to follow, there is a space for you in the field of the three R's. So to make, uh, to make a couple of examples, uh, biology and biotechnology are of course very adequate background uh, to develop alternative in vitro methods, but also experts in toxicology and pharmacology are needed uh, to um, understand the translation of the data generated with alternative methods to human beings. 
but also uh, computational and mathematical modeling are, are very much used as alternative tools. And people with this background are, are much required because I guess this is uh, a very peculiar application of computational sciences. So if you want to know more, uh, please visit the URL ECPAM webpage uh, where there is a section on education and training that you may find uh, useful. And also have a look at our uh, yearly status report that summarizes the activities that we carry on to replace, reduce and refine the use of animals in science. <laughs>